Hello, friends. Welcome to This Day in Jack Benny. I'm John Henderson. This episode is from February 8th, 1942. There was a movie theater on Sunset Boulevard in Los Angeles called the Oriental Theater. Like many theaters at the time, one day a week they held a sweepstakes. Anybody could enter to win a prize, but you had to be at the theater to collect it, or it would be given to somebody else. And since you were already at the theater, you might as well see a movie. Like Gene Autry in Cowboy Serenade. Yippee-ki-yay. On the radio, you could hear ventriloquist Edgar Bergen and his dummy, Charlie McCarthy. You know, I'm packing plenty of iron. Is that so? Yeah, and I got a date with my gal, a sweetheart of two bar rest. Is that so? Yeah. Yoo-hoo! That's for me. <laughs> Here I come, honk, honky tonk. There was the comedy team of Abbott and Costello. You know what I'm worried about? Why? Octopus. Octopuses? Yes, yeah, that's a fish with eight faces. How do you figure that out? Well, octo is eight. Yes. And a push is a push. Oh, come on. Please. Comedian Phil Baker. Didn't think I'd ever get here. I've never seen such traffic in my life. It was so bad on Broadway tonight, there were two women marooned on a safety island. Airplanes overhead dropping them sandwiches and powder puffs and things. It was... Really, the family program, The Great Gildersleeve. Oh, what have I gotten myself into? <laughs> Gee, what's wrong, huh? I don't know anything about automotors, Leroy. And of course, comedian and Jack Benny's greatest rival, Fred Allen. This is Fred Allen saying goodnight for the more than 45,000 Texaco dealers from coast to coast, inviting you to tune in again next Wednesday night. Good night. His program was actually going to be moving from Wednesdays to Sundays. And of course, all these radio programs relied heavily on the sound effects man. Oh, what would we do without the sound effects man, that radio racketeer? Tune your dial and listen a while. This is what you'll hear. There's a knock upon the door. That's the sound effects man. Here's a kiss and maybe more. That's the sound effects man. If you'd like a ring, he'll give you a ding, ding, ding. And even in the early morn, you'll hear him blowing his horn. Then his old Maxwell chugging right along. That's the sound effects man. He has gadgets by the score, from a peanut whistle to a cannon's roar. When Fibber runs to open that closet door, look out! Got to straighten out that closet one of these days. That's Virgil Reimer, the sound effects man. These days, the politically correct term is Inuit rather than Eskimo, and we wouldn't be so quick to make jokes based on stereotypes of a group of people. And the time change for Daylight Savings was the following day. If you'd like to contact me, you can email jackbennypodcast at gmail.com, or on Twitter, it's at thisdaybenny, and you can also listen to hundreds of Jack Benny episodes at thisdaybenny.com. So grab a bowl of Jell-O pudding and enjoy the show. J-E-L-L-O The Jell-O program brought to you by Jell-O and Jell-O pudding, starring Jack Benny. With Mary Livingston, Phil Harris, Dennis Day, Rochester, and yours truly, Don Wilson. The orchestra opens the program with Free for All.
well played by the orchestra. And now, ladies and gentlemen, as you all know, daylight saving time goes into effect tomorrow, and clocks throughout the country will be moved one hour ahead. That's right. So, without further ado, we bring you a man who will have only 11 hours sleep tonight instead of his usual 12, Jack Benny. Jack Benny. Thank you, thank you. Jalaw again, this is Jack Benny talking. And Don, I don't know where you got the impression that I sleep 12 hours a night. I'm up bright and early in the morning, the same as everybody else. Yes, Jack, but look at the time you go to bed. By 9 o'clock every night, you're in dreamland. And not on Wednesday nights. They don't raffle off the Plymouth at the Oriental until 9.30. <laughs> <laughs> By the time I get through arguing with the manager, it's usually two in the morning. Well, what's the idea of arguing with the manager? Listen, Don, I've been going to that theater for years now. It's about time I want a slab of bacon or something. <laughs> Anything. Huh? You mean as often as you've gone there, you've never won a prize? Well, my number was called on two different occasions, but, um, oh, forget it. No, 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 Jack. No, Jack. What happened? Well, you see, Don, when they call your number, you have to get up to the stage within 60 seconds. Uh-huh. Well, the first time, I didn't get there fast enough. And the second time, I was disqualified for wearing roller skates. <laughs> <laughs> I missed out on a case of minute tapioca. <laughs> uh, Anyway, Don, getting back to your introduction, you'll have to admit that it was hardly fair. Oh, come now, Jack. Just because you get to bed late on Wednesday nights, that doesn't make you a night owl. Well, it's not only Wednesday, big boy. Uh, you know, uh, you know what time I hit the hay last night? 4 a.m. 4 a.m.? My goodness, were you out night clubbing? Uh, no, it was Mr. Billingsley's fault. He was playing soldier outside my bedroom door, and just because I didn't know the password, he wouldn't let me in. <laughs> Uh, I'll know it, uh, I'll know it tonight, believe me What is the password, Jack? Well, it's, it's not exactly a word, Don I just have to go <laughs> A couple of times Oh, hello, Mary Hello, Jack What are you blubbing about? Oh, it's just a password Thank heaven, I thought radio had finally smacked you down <laughs> No, no, nothing like that My ears ring frequently, but that's about <laughs> all <laughs> That's good Say, Jack, did you tell Don the bad news? Not yet. What bad news? Well, on account of daylight saving next week, Jack is going to dock us all one hour's pay. One hour's pay? It's only for the duration. <laughs> You'll get it back as soon as the war is over. The hour or the money? Both. <laughs> it's wartime. And if there are any more objections, just read your contract. Who can read it? You got one whole page written in Eskimo. <laughs> Well... Mine, too. Now, what's the big idea? Because when the contracts were drawn up, my lawyers happened to be Smith, Smythe, Mullen, and Mooseface. <laughs> now, drop it. Leave it to Benny to get a lawyer that can spear fish for him, too. Mary, I retain Mooseface by the year. What's he going to do when someone isn't suing me? Just sit around? Be reasonable. Say, uh, Jack, what does that Eskimo clause in our contract mean? I I've never had it translated. I have. It says that... Uh, Actor who want rays can put high heels on snowshoes. <laughs> well, that's not a literal translation, but that's the gist of it. And I don't want you all reading your contract. If I hear another word about contracts, I'll scream. <laughs> uh, Virgil, Virgil, just make with the noise and no dialogue. You're only the sound man here. Well, I get more fan mail than you, you old tin type. <laughs> Get away from that microphone. I'll beat it. Oh, Jack, stop picking on Virgil. He's very important to our show, and you know it. Important? Yes, in all our plays, he opens doors, rings bells, shoots guns. Oh. And when you're supposed to walk down the street, Virgil walks for you. Virgil walks for me? Well, any sound man can do that. With your flat feet? That's hard, Daddy. <laughs> Virgil, I told you to get away from that mic. I never saw a guy with such hey, a... Hey, Jack, here comes night school Joe. Oh, yes, our, our French student. Hello, Phil. Bonsoir, folks, bonsoir. Hello, Jacquees. 
<laughs> Jacques. And Marie and Dune. Dune? Phil, a dune is a great big pile of sand. But I guess you're right. I don't... <laughs> anyway, uh, why don't you cut out that French? The stuff you say doesn't even make sense. Well, I learned a new one this week. Get a load of this, Jackson. Ma, orchestre, travail, don, dune, soupier. Hmm. What does that mean? My orchestra works in the soup tureen. <laughs> Your orchestra works in the soup tureen. Yeah, that's as close as I could get to built more bowls. <laughs> oh, well, Phil, don't you think that before taking up a foreign language, you ought to learn how to speak English? And what's wrong with my English, may I ask? You're kidding, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and now, folks... No, I ain't. What's wrong with my English? Phil, I met a Fiji Islander once with a ring in his nose who had only been in this country three weeks, and he speaks better English than you do. Much better. Well, then I gotta get one of them rings. <laughs> it won't help you, believe me. Let him get one. This is an emergency. Mary, if Phil ever puts a ring in his nose, Alice will sna snap a leash on it, sure as anything. And now, folks, Phil Harris and his 18 dreamboats will entertain us with a band number. Hit it, Phil. Wee oui, wee, oui, amigo. <laughs> Phil, amigo is Spanish. You're talking Spanish now. Then I want more money. Oh, play. <laughs> play, go ahead. Hold it a minute. Come in. Mr. Benny? Yes? Do you recognize me? No, I don't. Well, that's my fault. I should never have taken that ring out of my nose. <laughs> Get out of here. He's a Fiji Islander, all right. Look at that bushy head of hair. <laughs> Play, amigo. That was a medley of Deep in the Heart of Texas and the Eyes of Texas Are Upon You, played by Phil Harris and his orchestra, who may be heard nightly except Sunday in the soup tureen of the Biltmore Bowl. <laughs> Say, Phil, uh, that medley was really thrilling. Uh, how'd you happen to play it? Well, I got a lot of pals in Texas, and I don't want them to forget me. Oh, yes. You and the boys work down there every summer, don't you? Yeah. Last year, we did one-night stands in Fort Worth, Dallas, and Galveston, and then we played three months in Van Horn. <laughs> three months, eh? Yeah, that's what they gave my guitar player for stealing the cow. <laughs> uh, uh, stealing a cow? Well, he didn't exactly steal it. He tried to elope with it. You know how frank he is when he drinks. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, he must have eloped with that guitar, too. It's got Gene Autry's name on it. <laughs> now, let's see. Um, let's see, where are we? Well, it's about time for my play, isn't it, Jack? Oh, yes, yes, your play. And now, folks, uh, Mr. Don Wilson, that eminent American author, has written another of his famous one-act plays. Take it, Doon Wilson. <clears throat> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the scene is the honeymoon cottage of a young couple who have just been married. The bride, played by Mary Livingston... <laughs> Mary. <laughs> ...is awaiting the arrival of her husband, for whom she has just prepared her first dinner. We take you now to the home of Mr. and Mrs. Typical American. Oh, dear, it's 7 o'clock and my husband isn't home yet. Ah, here he comes now. Hello, sweetheart. Hello. Did you have a busy day at the office, Typical? <laughs> Oh, awful. That fresh boss of mine had me sitting on her knee all day. I'm a secretary, folks. Well, look what's on the table. Are you working a jigsaw puzzle, darling? Uh, no, that's your dinner. Yipe! <laughs> so you surprised me, eh, darling? Yes. Sit down, Tippy. My, this looks so good. Uh, what would you like with your dinner, sweetheart? Coffee, tea, or milk? Milk, please. Okay. <laughs> Virgil, the cow is milked already. <laughs> the milk's in the bottle. Now pay attention. Well, look at those homemade biscuits. Look at those homemade biscuits. Did you make them yourself? Yes, take this hammer and butter them. They are. <laughs> they are a little cementy. And my goodness, look at this platter of meat. You'll love it, dear. It's Swiss steak. Swiss steak? Ole, ole, hee Virgil! <laughs> Virgil, what's the matter with you? You're spoiling the illusion. Now sit down and take that alpine hat off your head. The cheese, too? Yes. <laughs> the whole darn outfit. Now let us alone so we can eat. Thirty minutes later. Calling all cars, calling all cars. Go to the home of typical American. He has a beautiful wife and a cute indigestion. <laughs> that is all. Ooh. Darling, what's the matter? Typical. Typical, speak to me. Ooh. Poor boy. Well, it looks like I'll have to eat this bowl of tempting and economical jello all by myself. Oh, no, you don't. Give me some of that, too. Even you can make Jell-O right. I thank you. Don, that was really marvelous. How did you ever think of such a clever commercial? Well, I was sleeping on my back last night and I dreamt it. Well, tummy down tonight, please. <laughs> uh, not, uh, not that I didn't like it, Don, but, well... I thought you were lost, Dennis. Where were you, kid? I'm not a kid anymore. I just fell in a manhole. <laughs> oh, fine. He fell in a manhole. Fell in a manhole. That makes him a man. I suppose, you, I suppose if you fell in a gopher hole, you'd be a gopher. Yeah. Jack fell in a rat hole once. Oh, quiet. <laughs> anyway, I'm, uh, I'm glad you got here, Dennis. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Well, say, Mr. Benny, have I got a surprise for you? Have I got a surprise? Uh, later, later, kid. For our feature attraction, this... Uh, what do you mean, surprise? Here, read this. I cut it out of a radio column. Let's see it. So, so... Well, I'll be darned. Get a load of this, fellas. It is reported officially from New York that starting March 8th, Fred Allen will switch the time of his broadcast from Wednesday to Sunday night. Imagine. Well, I knew that. He's replacing the Sunday evening symphony hour. Allen's replacing the symphony hour? 
Well, they better tell everybody in advance, or when they hear Alan's voice, they'll think it's an old bassoon left over. <laughs> anyway, if Alan goes on the air Sundays, I'm going off. I can make a darn good living out of pictures. Oh, how many postcards of your house do you sell a week? <laughs> Plenty, sister. Anyway, I don't want Alan on the air the same day as I am. But, Jack, there are a lot of comedians besides you on Sunday night. One more won't hurt. A lot of comedians. Name one. Edgar Bergen and Charlie McCarthy. That's two. Name one. <laughs> now, I, I, I dare you. Oh, Jack, you know very well that Edgar Bergen plays both parts. McCarthy is a dummy. Oh, oh, so you're falling for that stuff, too, eh? <laughs> I happen to know that Charlie McCarthy is just as much flesh and blood as I am. On flesh, I won't argue. <laughs> no argument on blood, either. I got plenty in my veins. Mr. Benny is right. I gave him a transfusion yesterday. <laughs> you didn't give me anything. I paid you $5 a gallon. <laughs> Now, be quiet. Gee, I'm so weak, I can hardly stand up. <laughs> well, well, it's your own fault. You didn't say when. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> anyway, I've, I've got to do something about Alan. Gosh, I'm dizzy. <laughs> Dennis, Dennis, eat liver. You'll get it back. <laughs> I know what, Mary. Mary, get me Mr. John Swallow on the phone. His private extension is 309. Okay. I'm going to nip this in the bud. He's the program manager. I'm going to straighten out this Allen Sunday night situation. I don't get mad often, but when I do... Hello? Hello, yeah. Mr. Swallow. Oh. Hello, Mr. Swallow. Where did you get back from Catastrophe? <laughs> Give me that phone. <laughs> Give me that phone. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Swallow. This is Jack Benny. Say, I just found out something, and I'd like to talk to you about it. Now, I'm not going to stand for any... I'm glad you called, Jack. What? Mr. Williams, the, uh, the censor, tells me he's been having a little trouble with you. Trouble with the censor? Who, me? Yes. Now, Jack, when he tells you to take a joke out of your program, don't argue about it. Take it out. What? Wait a minute, Mr. Swallow. Are you referring to the gag we were going to do about cooking flapjacks on a griddle? I certainly am, and you ought to be ashamed of yourself. Well, well, for heaven's sake, what's wrong with cooking flapjacks on a griddle? The word griddle sounds exactly like girdle. <laughs> sounds exactly... Mr. Swallow, I defy you, Mr. Williams, or Oscar of the Waldorf, to cook flapjacks on a girdle. It can't be done. That's not the point. The line is still double on tundra. And don't pull that Phil Harris stuff. <laughs> I like that griddle gag very much. Well, it's definitely out. All right, all right. Goodbye. Goodbye. Hmm. Harmless little gag about hotcakes, and I can't even do it. Well, come on, Dennis. Sing your song. Well, what'd you do about Fred Allen? Who? Oh, my goodness. I forgot all about him. I'll take it up later. Well, come on, come on, Dennis. Let's have a song. Okay. Get so burned up lately, I must be getting high blood pressure. With my blood, yes. <laughs> oh, quiet, sing. There must be some way of fixing that Sunday night thing. Oh, life is a 
stars that shine What's to become of it This love of mine I cry my heart It's bound to break Since nothing matters The sun and the moon A star that shine What to become of it This love of mine That was This Love of Mine, sung by Dennis Day. And very good, Dennis. Sure, and it was wonderful, Begotta. And now, ladies and gentlemen... Well, Dennis, your blood is working on him. <laughs> yes, it is at that. Gee, I wish there wasn't such a tight wad. We'd all get a raise. <laughs> Hooray, I've got an alibi. And now, folks... Hey, uh, Jack, what are you going to do about the Fred Allen situation? Yeah, you going to let that guy get away with it? Well, I've been thinking it over, gentlemen, and I'm going to form a little group that'll take care of him. The S-A-A-L-C. What's that stand for? Sunday Artists Against Low Comedy. <laughs> I'm going to send letters to Bergen, Abbott and Costello, Phil Baker, Gildersleeve, and all of them. What about me? I'm a Sunday artist. You're a Sunday... Well, I'm having enough trouble with Mr. Swallow. <laughs> but I'll have my lawyer send you a letter anyhow. It only costs $10 to join. That Eskimo isn't getting any $10 out of me, Sugarfoot. <laughs> Who asked you? Now, get this straight, Virgil. You're not a comedian. You're a sound man and not a very good one at that. I don't know why I don't yank that wig right off your head. <laughs> you lay one hand on me and you'll... Oh, Jack, stop pointing at your glasses. He won't hit you. Never mind. I got more important things to do than argue with this guy. Until March 8th, I'll be working day and night. You mean to say that you're going to all this trouble just to keep Alan off the air Sundays? I owe it to the public. It's a crusade. That's what it is. Well, gee, I don't know what all this fuss is about. Personally, I think Mr. Allen is wonderful. Dennis, you're fired. <laughs> anyway, Don, get out, get out, scram, kid. <laughs> anyway, Don, I think I'll send you... Leave the music here, Dennis. It's not yours. <laughs> Anyway, Don, get back in the manhole cover. <laughs> I think, Don, I think I'll send you, a, I think I'll send you an application blank, too. And then if we all stick together, we, I'll take it. Hello? Hello, Mr. Benny, this is Rochester. What do you want? Boss, I always thought that border of ours was cuckoo, and now I know it. Mr. Billingsley, what's the trouble now? He's playing soldier again. This morning, he locked me in my room for three hours. Well, why didn't you give him the password? It's little, 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 little. That was yesterday. Today is... <laughs> oh, so he, so he changed it, eh? Well, I'm glad you told me. I don't want to have to go to a hotel tonight. Now, uh, Rochester, you just humor Mr. Billingsley and let him play soldier. He's perfectly harmless. What about that shotgun he carries around? That shotgun isn't loaded. It ain't, eh? No. You know that big picture we got in the library of George Washington across from the Delaware? Yes. Well, he'll never make it in that boat. It's full of holes. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rochester. He's going to pay for that painting. He paid for it already. Good. You ought to see his new $5 bills. He's got my picture on them. 
Oh, for heaven's sake. And you know what else, boss? What? You're secretary of the treasury. <laughs> oh, well, he's just having fun. He prints them on Kleenex. He can't be a counterfeiter. Well, Rochester, I'll be home pretty soon, so don't worry. Goodbye. Goodbye. Oh, oh, say, Rochester, where's Mr. Billingsley now? He's out in the garage squeezing orange juice. Squeezing orange juice in the garage? Yeah, he nails an orange on the wall and then bats the Maxwell into it. <laughs> Well, I'll see you in a little while. So long. So long. I was wondering where those yellow spots on my garage wall came from. I thought there was something wrong with my eyes. Play, Phil. If you have a family that loves rich, tempting desserts, then don't wait another day to serve this one. It's a delightful jello treat called Imperial Peach Mold, a grand-looking, good-looking dessert that's not only delicious, but easy to make. Here's all there is to it. Simply dissolve one package of orange jello in a pint of hot water and peach juice and chill until slightly thickened. Next, fold in one cup of canned sliced peaches drained. Or, if you wish, use one box of quick frozen sliced peaches freshly thawed. Then mold and chill until firm. And there's a really special treat, a rich shimmering combination of juicy sliced peaches and sunny orange jello. So get a can of sliced peaches or a box of quick frozen sliced peaches from your grocer tomorrow and treat yourself to this swell dessert. When you make it, be sure to use genuine Jell-O because Jell-O is extra delicious thanks to its new locked-in flavor. We're a little late, so good night, folks. Remember this name, folks. Jell-O Butterscotch Pudding. It's the name of one of America's most popular desserts. The name of a grand pudding that's sure to become one of your special favorites. Jell-O Butterscotch Pudding is marvelously smooth and luscious with a swell homemade goodness. And it's full of golden butterscotch flavor. So tomorrow, when you order Jell-O, get Jell-O puddings in all three flavors. Chocolate, vanilla, and butterscotch. Jell-O puddings are just like grandma's, only more so. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. KFI Los Angeles.